Hi, my name is Jacob Lisi. Um, I work at Grafana Labs. I do a lot of work on the back end of Grafana Cloud and uh, work on some plugins, including the uh, Kubernetes app, which um, is on GitHub. It's open source. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that today, among other things. So Kubernetes and Grafana. Who here uses Kubernetes? And I'm assuming everyone here uses Grafana. It's a safe bet. <laughs> um, so. I'm going to start off with a little bit about what Kubernetes is for those of you who don't use it. Um, I'll try and be quick because I want to get to more of the monitoring specific stuff. So what is Kubernetes? This is pulled straight from the site. Kubernetes is a portable, extensible, open source platform for managing containerized workloads and services that facilitates both declarative configuration and automation. Basically, Kubernetes is a lot of tooling that allows you to run containers at scale. Um, and it gives developers a lot of control and operations people a lot of visibility into how they're running their services. Um, in terms of monitoring Kubernetes, I want to say that Prometheus is, I would say, the de facto standard. Not necessarily because, sorry, I adjusted that image, so it slightly covers that text right there. But um, not necessarily because it's the best time series database, but the service discovery is really what's special in uh, Kubernetes. Um, and by that, I mean, when I say Kubernetes, I mean the actual application Kubernetes, Kubelet, the Kube API server, because all those applications are instrumented to report, Kubernetes, uh, to report Prometheus metrics. So I highly recommend that if you're using Kubernetes, you take advantage of those endpoints. It doesn't matter if you store them in Prometheus or you use some other database to, get those, to uh, visualize those metrics, but I highly recommend that you use the standard interface to get those metrics. So it's really nice. There's actually a very simple paradigm when using Kubernetes to um, get metrics. You can add an annotation to a service, or technically the default one is prometheus.io slash scrape, but you can really use anything you want. Um, it can be organization specific. But this gives Prometheus service discovery an easy way to find your service, and there's some other annotations to find ports and things like that. But Prometheus service discovery is a really solid tool, and it's already out of the box works. It finds your applications, it finds your metrics, and collects them. So on the right is a very basic diagram of Kubernetes and the things you would be monitoring within it. So the first thing you have is the kubelet. This is uh, an application that runs on your node. It's kind of the base for your Kubernetes cluster. It's the process that lives on the hardware. Um, the kubelet actually has a metrics endpoint. It's a bastardized version of C Advisor. Um, so it's the advisor, but without access to any of the flags and Kubernetes-specific metrics. Uh, so that endpoint is your starting point. So this will have um, low-level stuff, a lot of stuff considering um, like C groups and Linux, like things about that are very container-specific, but not necessarily application-aware. The next thing you have is the node exporter. Um, this is up to you whether or not you want to run your node exporters in Kubernetes or underneath, but. If you run them in Kubernetes, you just have to expose the underlying proc file systems in Linux. This is uh, pretty standard stuff. Uh, we'll get you CPU, disk, memory, all the basics, everything you're used to in uh, any kind of hardware uh, Linux monitoring uh, collector. The next thing is cube state metrics. This is more application aware than the other two. Um, cube state metrics um, basically is an abstraction over the Kubernetes API that gets you stuff about how many deployments are running, all of the abstract resources in Kubernetes. Kube state metrics is where you get that kind of information. So um, the, let me just explain for people who don't necessarily use Kubernetes. Um, there's a number of resources in Kubernetes that are used to, defi to define how you deploy your containers and your services. So these are just abstractions on top of uh, Linux that Kubelet basically interprets and runs your applications and also networks them. and there's a lot more stuff on that that would be in another talk, but that's basically all you need to know. Cube state metrics gives you information on these abstract resources. So you have a configuration for a pod that says run container X and Y. Cube state metrics will tell you how many of those pods are running, where those pods are running, what namespace they are, what metadata they have. So things like that are what you use cube state metrics for. etcd is a key value store. It's a distributed. It's kind of the backbone to Kubernetes. It's how it manages all the distributed workloads it has. Um, the monitoring that is also somewhat straightforward. Um, you don't have to necessarily look at that Kubernetes specific, but etcd needs to be healthier or else you'll start seeing problems with latency, and uh, Kubernetes won't necessarily work as expected. So 
And when looking into Kubernetes and creating this presentation, one of the things I did early on was say, what does the Kubernetes team actually think that is important with uh, Kubernetes? What are the SLOs, basically? So I found two SLOs from the scalability uh, special interest group, and they're pretty simple. The pod startup time, so this is how long it takes for your pod to start up. It, this does not include downloading the container from the Docker registry. But if your pods are all starting up in the 99th percentile under five seconds, that's defined as a healthy Kubernetes cluster. Um, and this is really what Kubernetes is targeting in terms of an SLO. So most people are pretty happy with applications starting in under five seconds. And uh, we are at Grafana Labs. So that's definitely something to look for if you're monitoring Kubernetes. Make sure you're hitting the SLOs, because you should be hitting the SLOs. This is what the this is what Kubernetes is designed to do. The next thing is API responsiveness. So Kubernetes works through a REST API. Um, you basically just want to make sure that the latencies on that are low. Um, it's your control plane. If it's not responsive quickly, you're, you're going to have problems. Things are not going to work as expected. So here's a few graphs in Grafana. And underneath, I put a prompt QL query. Um, and uh, those graphs won't just work with that query. You have to do a little bit of formatting uh, and change the x-axis. So if you try this with just the query and get mad, I'm sorry, you can message me on Slack and I'll tell you what I actually did. Or I'll make a dashboard public, actually. That's a better idea. But um, this is pod startup latency. Um, this is, I think, on our QA cluster. As you can see, within the 99th percentile, where our QA cluster is starting in under 8 milliseconds. So that's pretty performant, although we're, only, we're not necessarily at the scale that the SLO requires. Um, I think it's like 5,000 nodes to be under five seconds. Um, the next one is a sample query to get API latency. Um, so again, these are just all of the requests for the REST API that Kubernetes uses to deploy um, all of the abstract resources, or remove them, or watch them. As you can see, this is on a log scale. So you may be saying, like, wow, that watch call takes 1,000 second latencies. It's because it's an open connection. So uh, that is expected. Um, one thing I also want to add is, when I was looking into the SLO for Kubernetes, if you use a managed Kubernetes instance, um, like AKS with Microsoft, or the GKS with Google, or whatever Amazon has, or any other one out there that exists, I highly recommend you find their SLA and their SLOs, because most of the time there's financial reimbursement if they don't meet it. So someone should maybe make a tool <laughs> that makes sure that they're beating their SLO so you can get your money back if they fail. Um, <laughs> But um, that's an aside. So the next thing I want to talk about is Kubernetes metadata. I think that this is a really important topic. Um, and it needs to be discussed more in more of an organizational context rather than a technical context. Because metadata is really how you organize your services across your organization. And I mean, a lot of people here have worked in monitoring in large organizations. Organization is really key more so than having the data stored. It's really important to get that data accessible in a reasonable way that's understandable by your internal customers, which I think is a much more difficult challenge most of the time. So let's talk about the two types of metadata in Kubernetes. The first one is annotations. That will. So when you're writing out your configuration files in Kubernetes or your deployment files, Annotations is one of the first things that come into play. So annotations are machine readable. These are the metadata that is meant to be read by machines. It's usually in some kind of URI format. Um, an example right there is pretty generic. Earlier, you saw the prometheus.io slash scrape. That's another annotation. It's machine readable by Prometheus. There's a few others that Prometheus used to define like port numbers or which um, endpoint to scrape, like the actual URL, I, th I think. Um, so stuff like that is what you would have internally within Kubernetes for your systems to enter in services to interact with each other. Labels are meant to be human readable. So this is the stuff that is important in terms of organizing it among the people in your organization. And this is where I think you have to get things right. Um, so the, one of the reasons I highly recommend Prometheus is that it uses um, a, an explicit uh, metadata format. So Anyone here who's used Graphite knows what an implicit metadata format is. The current Graphite has tags now, so things have changed. But in the past, you would have dot-separated metrics, and your metadata would be interspersed between it. With Kubernetes, you have a lot of metadata, so something like that would get tricky quick. Um, I, if you run Kubernetes in production, there's a good chance that, like any service, you're going to start having 
abstract contextual met metadata that people apply for God knows what reason, but it's just someone needs a way to organize the information and everyone has a different way of organizing it across the organization. So metadata tends to explode and uh, this is a problem for a number of reasons. I mean, cardinality in databases, which I might talk about a bit later, I mean, this is, metadata is the bane of that. Um, so back in the day, we had implicit tags and this is like the dream of implicit tags. Uh, a simple piece of metadata followed by the name of the metric. But what ends up happening in an organization a lot of the times is you'll not just want one piece of metadata, you'll want six. And another <laughs> difficulty is even within or across different orgs, none of this metadata is consistent. So no two organizations or even teams within organizations will have the same order for how they define their metadata. And this can be hugely problematic in terms of people not having to get used to or adjusted when working at a new company or even just exposing this information to people within your company. So getting consistent on this is really important. I think this is something that Kubernetes has the chance to do right off the bat. By having, the, by having Kubernetes define the um, metrics for you, all of Kubernetes is, is pretty much instrumented to supply its own metrics. Kubernetes pretty much supplies its own metadata. So we should take advantage of that this time around, um, unlike when we just had nodes and everyone kind of picked their own abstractions. So, I think one thing that can be really important going forward in the Kubernetes community is trying to take advantage of the already defined standards. Um, and this is an example of what metrics would look like in Kubernetes, although those wouldn't be dot separated, those are each just a different key value tag. Um, and so it doesn't matter if you have random metrics in your organization that not everyone else uses. As long as you have a pretty straightforward set across the Kubernetes community, Kubernetes monitoring, monitoring will look very similar from organization to organization. And that allows the open source community to make tooling without having to worry about specific use cases, which is really nice, actually. Because um, open source tooling has always struggled to keep up with highly customized environments. But if, we can, if the Kubernetes community is, stays as standardized as it should be, it hopefully will be different this time around and we can have open source tooling just as good as a lot of the vendor tooling that used to, that exists. So one thing I do want to mention is the curse of dimensionality. Um, one issue in the past is when you have something like containers, a container name will change after every time you boot it up. You, and when a container dies, the next one won't necessarily have the same metadata. So the curse of dimensionality basically says that the more dimensions you add to a metric, the uh, <laughs> iterating through that metric becomes an O2 to the exponent problem. I mean, reverse indexes change this, so this isn't actually an honest portrayal. Um, but you do run into this issue, especially when you're trying to do uh, functional, like when you're putting functions on top of your data. So one thing with uh, Kubernetes is, um, especially we combine with Prometheus, is to not necessarily overload your metrics with metadata, but rather have either have metrics in a specific Kubernetes ob, like Prometheus metric and have that metric exploded with metadata, but then just use that metric to join with other metrics when you're trying to contextualize. You just need a consistent UID to, jo to do these joins. So I want to, so one of the main things I want to get lay forward is that try and use the standard Kubernetes tags that are supplied straight out of the box with the Prometheus exporters. Um, if you want to add other tags or make new tags, do that, but don't change the old ones because you want, if you do, if you do, you won't necessarily, it'll be hard for open source tooling to meet your use cases. So I think that's one thing that the Kubernetes community should really strive to do. Um, another thing is in Kubernetes, you're gonna have metadata explosions, so you have to be okay with dropping labels or at some point like certain metrics are not gonna be lasting for multiple years in, in certain use cases. You have to be comfortable with aggregating certain data and leaving other data behind. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is the Kubernetes app, the plugin that we've created at Grafana Labs. Um, so right now we basically give you the ability to filter on metadata that's not necessarily in the metric um, and narrow it down and we use uh, other IDs as a hash to basically filter out the list. So I want to give an example of this. Um, so let me pull up Grafana. Uh, this is uh, running on my local, and I have the Kubernetes app installed. Um, let me just show you what the, it, we're on version 1.01, .01. you can find it on our plugin repository, pretty easy to install. Um, and you just connect it to your cluster, and then there's certain Prometheus exporters, and you 
need to be running Prometheus service discovery and have PromQL to take advantage of the dashboards, but to get the metrics, you just need Prometheus service discovery. And currently, we use the API for filtering, so technically you can use this, the metadata filters without Prometheus, and, you can use, and uh, you'll see what I mean in a second by that. So let's go to uh, this. This is uh, a look at the cluster. Um, I'm going to show you a quick uh, peek at how to configure a cluster. So you see right here, you can go down. And then in the data source settings, you actually specify Prometheus read data source. So the, the Kubernetes cluster becomes a data source. But then internally within that data source is a reference to a Prometheus data source. So basically, if you have multiple clusters, you can have the data source as a template tag. And as you switch clusters, it'll automatically update the reference to the Prometheus that you're using. Um, so this is a look at uh, the cluster dashboard. Um, it's a pretty generic overview of the cluster, the cluster pod usage, CPU usage, um, the number of pods running. This is a pretty broad view. This dashboard is pretty simple, um, and then we also have a deployment dashboard, which is pretty out of the box, not really much there. But I think one of the cooler ones to look at is the node dashboard. So this is a dashboard that shows you each node in the cluster and kind of aggregates basic information about the nodes. It takes heavy advantage of the node exporter. Um, the cool thing at the top is this uh, panel that we created at Grafana Labs. Um, so it allows you to basically click on a node, drill down, and this is done through the Kubernetes API. It goes in and uh, queries about that node, gets the metadata about that node. Um, so it really gives you the ability to drill down and see what you're dealing with um, when, looking, when debugging Kubernetes or just seeing how your cluster is performing. And then all of these adjust to that. So as you can see in the top left, in this template tag is the Kubernetes cluster data source. There's another data source for local cube. I don't have a local cube running, so if we click that, everything will break. Um, but if I did, and then it had a Prometheus setup, it would technically switch to that Prometheus data source and query it. So let's get back to the test cluster. Um, and the next one I really want to show you is kind of the real meat of this. And you'll see what I was talking about in terms of metadata is the, not the deployment one, the container one. So this is our container dashboard. And so basically, this is just information about pods running on this cluster. Um, and the really cool part is basically, this panel allows you to filter down your metadata at the top. So instead of having a template tag at the top with a drop down for the pod, you can use this panel to select which pod you want to view. So if we wanted to see what this node exporter was, or what this Prometheus is up to, we select and filter by the Prometheus node, and then all the panels will update to just that node. And the other really cool aspect to this is that not every Prometheus metric we collect has all the metadata about, not, has all the metadata about that pod. But we, are, we were able to filter down and basically come down, we're basically able to filter down, get the metadata, and then find the pods that have that metadata and use that as a filter for the template tag. So in the, you wouldn't necessarily be able to filter by every label, but with this, you can, use your, you can add these template tags to your Grafana dashboard and do that. So um, let me find a good example. Um, so this Grafana K8S app is something we add to components specific, the exporter specific to this application. So if we click that, we see these are the pods for the node exporter and the cube state metrics. All they're, they're all running. And we were able to filter down on a pretty obscure label that not every metric that we wouldn't have that metric in every, in every memory usage Prometheus metric. We're not going to ever want to use that as a template tag in a query in a dashboard. But using this, we don't have to have it in the query in the dashboard. We can have it living outside and using it as a filter on top of the template variable. So this is really, I think this is really cool. And I think that this is just the beginning of what we can start doing with Kubernetes in terms of like extended plugins and things that can make managing Kubernetes in Grafana and make just the general Kubernetes experience with Grafana much better. And a lot of that, I think, goes back to the fact that Kubernetes has taken a pretty firm has given us a pretty good set of standards and a pretty good way of doing things that can be consistent across organizations for the most part. Um, 
one way you can one way you can keep track of this, and we really want to keep on top of, is the API conventions within Kubernetes. So underneath the hood, Kubernetes has a group of API machinery, and the special interest groups have a pretty standard way of changing that and updating that and are very consistent about it. And for the most part, a lot of the resources are pretty consistent at this point. They're still adding more, and we're going to try and keep up and do whatever we can. But uh, the pattern for accessing these and the way that they structure metadata within these is very consistent across it. So it gives us a very consistent interface in which it gives us a very consistent way of accessing metrics and dealing with the metadata within metrics. Um, and in the future, we want to basically have panels that allow you to filter on random metadata for every resource within Kubernetes. That would be really cool, I think. And because the metadata and annotations are so generic and the Kubernetes um, Prometheus metrics are pretty generic in terms of how they provide uh, metadata objects. I think we can do this in a way that's generic. Currently, right now, we've um, specifically coded for the four uh, temp panels that we support. But I think in the future, we can do this in a very generic way, which I think would be really cool and probably not as much work as you would think. Um, so as I said, like being able to query on a few extra dimensions isn't special. but the fact that we can keep consistent metadata across the board would allow monitoring Kubernetes in an open source way to be kind of turnkey, similar to how something like Datadog would be in the past for nodes. They would find what you're running and act automatically query, query it. But like with Kubernetes, we can have turnkey experiences in Kubernetes without having to go to a vendor. And I think that that's really cool. And I hope that going forward, we don't end up with a fractured landscape of practices and tools that all report and collect metrics in a different way. I really think that if, this, if we can keep this standardized, the open source community for Kubernetes will really benefit. Um, and I just want to give out a shout out to Daniel Lee. He did a lot of the work on that plugin, and I kind of just did a little bit and tweaked it, and now I get to present it. But <laughs> um, So I think shout out to him if you want to clap or something. <laughs> like, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> 